One of the more common narratives, uh, at least outside of the LGBTQ community, is that after marriage was legalized in 2015, that the LGBTQ community is at a, a pretty good place now, right? Uh, that we've come a long way, there's been a lot of progress made, and things are generally okay for the queer community, broadly speaking. When in reality, it's the case that LGBTQ people across the country, uh, including in more liberal places like on the coast and in big cities, continue to experience routine discrimination and harassment. And there are a number of areas of law, including for youth and including in housing, where LGBTQ people are not protected at all, and even in the face of that routine discrimination. Yeah, I grew up on the Iron Range in Minnesota, and then right out of high school, moved to St. Cloud State. I started using drugs and alcohol to cope. I dropped out of college and was really struggling, got to the point where I was no longer paying my rent because I was having issues holding a steady job, and then wound up getting evicted from my apartment. I was living out of my car for a period of time and, and bouncing around on people's couches, and then my car was repossessed. <laughs> uh, and so it was, it was going through this whole period of getting depressed, um, having suicidal ideations, and then finding myself, you know, without without stable housing. So there are no, uh, there's no single determining factor that leads to a person experiencing homelessness in general. And the same is true for LGBTQ people and for LGBTQ youth. There are many, many factors that could lead to someone experiencing homelessness. We need to look at other factors that people are facing. You know, whether it's food instability, lack of access to opportunity, or lack of uh, access to, to training and workforce development solutions. People are rent burdened because they have childcare costs. I mean, there are so many things that play into that, that we need to treat the other symptoms in, that, that are happening and not just focus solely on building more housing. We need to have a much more diverse and inclusive approach to helping people be able to afford and get access to housing. Family rejection is definitely one of the contributing factors to many LGBTQ youth experiencing homelessness. Um, we know that that's true both because of the personal stories and, and narratives that we've seen from folks who've had that experience, but also from broader statistics that show us that LGBTQ youth are more than twice as likely as non-LGBTQ youth to experience homelessness in their lifetime. And so we know that uh, family rejection is part of that, or their being LGBTQ at least contributes in some way to their likelihood of experiencing homelessness. And for black LGBTQ youth, they are four times as likely uh, as white non-LGBTQ youth to experience homelessness. So this is definitely, uh, family rejection is definitely a part of it, but again, it's not the only factor that leads to experiences of homelessness. Well, I, I wasn't aware of any other additional support services or community programs that were available for LGBTQ people and or people experiencing even substance abuse and or mental health issues or housing instability. So I had no idea where to turn for support. And other than the people that I had in my life, I really didn't know. And so in the example of housing in particular, uh, recent surveys, nationally representative surveys, show that about one in four LGBTQ people have experienced discrimination in housing. And if you look just at transgender people, that number is pretty much the same. About one in four transgender people in the last year alone have experienced discrimination in housing because of their transgender identity. And so despite this broader narrative that things are much better than they used to be, or at least that things are pretty much fine now after marriage, this is still a routine experience for many people in the LGBTQ community. Yeah, we have to, to ensure that we're inclusive for queer and trans individuals, you have, we have to look at the policies themselves. And the first thing, the easiest thing to do is look at language. Frankly, are we using inclusive language in our policies? Are we putting an equity lens to our policies? The best way to do it is to get the people that are affected to the table. We have to have those voices be a part of the conversation in shaping policy development and then seeking authentic community engagement throughout the process so that when we come through on the other end of it, we can ensure that we are actually meeting the needs of the communities that are directly affected by programming and by policies all along the way. I was very fortunate to have some people that no matter, no matter how bad I screwed up, they didn't give up on me. It's more about a broader fraying of relationships over time within that family that increases the likelihood that the child will experience homelessness after coming out. Uh, and so that 
fraying of relationships can be due to a number of different factors, including the family's struggle to accept their child, but also due to other or influenced by other contributing factors that are, have nothing to do with the kid being LGBTQ. It could be anything from economic insecurity or job loss or some kind of experience of trauma or uh, s struggling with addiction or recovery. There could be any number of things that are creating this broader family instability that lead to their potentially experiencing homelessness. You have to surround yourself with support systems and that's gonna look different for everybody. And I would just say that you're normal and you're beautiful, you know, and finding people that will affirm your identities and that will uplift you and be there for you no matter what. Those are the types of people and the relationships that you have to have in your life.